Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Russell Brooks, the Associate Director for Executive Education and Online Learning here at LSE. And um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today, the fourth in a series of five daily webinars on the theme skills for a post COVID-19 world as part of the LSE Festival. Welcome back to those of you who've joined us earlier in the week. It's great to see you again. And hello to those of you joining us for the first time. It's great to have you with us. In each session, we are being guided by the LSE faculty who've been involved in developing our portfolio of online certificate courses, who are considering the professional skills that we all need to succeed in a post COVID world. Each day our speakers will discuss research trends in their field, as well as practical ways to upskill your professional capabilities to meet future challenges and opportunities. You'll also have your chance to pose questions to the speakers. As some of you who've been here all week will know that as we wait for everyone to arrive, we're encouraging you to uh, let us know in the chat where in the world you're joining us from. It's uh, every day it's been great to have, um, although these are advertised as lunchtime sessions, we've definitely had people having breakfast um, and, and supper. So it's great to have, uh, see where everyone is. So please do um, let us know in the chat. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Faulkner, Dr. Carsten Sorensen, Professor Leslie Wilcox, and Dr. Need Dunn, who will be talking to us on the topic of technological disruption. The fourth industrial revolution has transformed the way we work and live. Digital platforms have upended traditional business models and are disrupting ever more industries in a post-COVID world. Our speakers today will consider both the disruptive nature of technological change and the practical ways we can respond to it from a multidisciplinary perspective. All four are contributors to our brand new online certificate course, which uh, uh, technological disruption, managing the impact on business, society and politics, which we're very exciting will be running for the first time next week. And you can find out more about that by clicking, uh, by visiting the website on the slide, onlinecourses.lse.ac.uk. So I'm gonna now hand over to uh, Dr. Robert Faulkner, who will be guiding you through the event today. Thanks, Robert. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Russell, for the introduction and great to have everyone on this call. I, I can see participants from around the world have joined us from all parts of the world indeed. Um, my name is Robert Faulkner, as Russell said, I'm an Associate Professor in International Relations here at the LSE, and I also happen to be the convener of the new course on technological disruption. I'm very pleased to welcome to this panel three esteemed LSE colleagues who have contributed to this new online course, and I will introduce them one by one as they make their opening statements. But let me just briefly outline what we want to focus on in this panel discussion. We all know that the digital revolution is sweeping through business and society. The first question that we will address is just how much change has been produced in the world of business by the arrival of digital technologies and new business models, platform business models. And we'll try and assess just how disruptive this arrival of technologies such as uh, companies are based on new technologies such as Uber, such as Amazon has been. In a second step, we will focus on the unique market power that these technology giants have amassed and what we can do about controlling them. This raises difficult questions for existing competition policies. And we'll look at uh, current approaches, but perhaps also what needs to change in this area. And then finally, we'll take a look at the future and what new technologies will do to current labor markets. Will automation, artificial intelligence, robotics, Will they destroy ever more jobs? Will we face a new wave of technological unemployment? Or is this all overhyped and, and overrated? So we've got a fantastic program ahead of us. And uh, I will now invite our three panelists who are experts in these areas to speak to these topics. Uh, before I do so, I'd just like to remind the audience that we will, after the initial round of introductions, have a Q&A session. So if you would like to put a question to the panelists, which I will then try and read out as many of, of those as possible, then put them in the Q&A func uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Just uh, give us your name, uh, your affiliation with the LSE or not, where you're from, and put your question and I will then try and get as many of your questions into the discussion. All right, so 
let me first introduce our first speaker, Carsten Sorensen, who is an Associate Professor of Information Systems and Innovation in the Department of Management here at LSE. He has long studied the business and consumer impact of digital technology innovations, particularly focusing on mobile infrastructures and, and platforms. And he has a truly deep knowledge of just how technology has disrupted the business world. Carsten, I'd like to put to you my initial question, which is all about that business impact. Dis digital technologies have given rise to new so-called platform businesses. We're familiar with them, the Amazons, the Ubers of, of the global economy. And these have truly disrupted a growing number of existing market. Tell us what's unique about these platform businesses and why have they had such a huge impact? Yeah, so thank you very much, Robert. So you could, you could argue that um, the reason we have large hierarchical organizations was uh, really the cost of communicating between people when companies had to become large. And these companies have then tried over the decades to become more nimble, more um, responsive to market demands, for example, through outsourcing that I know Leslie has studied for many, many years, uh, offshoring, all sorts of internal markets. And the point was there that this new operating model of the digital platform, it beats all of these attempts hands down. And it does so by simply uh, the simple logic of trying to keep all the innovation or much of the innovation effort at the core to create this core stable platform and then to really um, have as few people as possible there and then distribute a lot of the effort or as much effort as possible to the edges, to either people who uh, take the risk themselves in terms of the jobs they do as Uber drivers um, or as app developers or uh, customers like us in automated uh, customer self-service arrangements. So really the idea of, of de-risking the whole arrangement by trying to let others take a lot of the risk uh, is the key. And, and the way these platforms, of course, have amassed their power is to this scaling effect uh, that if you have more people sign up on your platform than other platforms, then it's more likely that even more people will sign up. And so this kind of uh, in, um, flywheel of customer acquisition, it, it means that these platforms very quickly become uh, either successful or less successful. And we can, of course, see the duopoly of Apple and Google for app phone, uh, for operating system for smartphones with apps and other content ha has shown this where Microsoft has tried and spent billions of dollars trying to compete and never really succeeded. So in addition to these kind of transactions, uh, transaction machineries, the platforms can also be di the digital innovation platforms where um, the platform will allow uh, people to go and collect some digital Lego bricks. So I'm originally Danish, so I thought I'd use a bit of product placement there. And the point is there you get these digital uh, Lego bricks and you are then allowed to stick them together as you want. And you put uh, your little Lego figurine, a digital one, you put it on the shelf in the app store and then you get 70 percent of the profit from, from, the, of the, uh, from the sale of it. And the point is there, this has allowed highly distributed innovation where anybody who wants can participate, but it's coordinated at arm's length. So the, the central platform doesn't have to hire a huge amount of people to help coordinate it. Now, uh, so if we look at what happened in this case in the music business, um, so in the music business, they thought the record was the music and it turned out once you could download it from uh, the internet because it'd been ripped from a CD, uh, it was no longer the recording. The music was something else than the recording. Uh, so Steve Jobs from Apple and later others managed to make these agreements with the music industry that suddenly moved the power from established arrangements uh, to these platform companies. And then even good old Steve Jobs uh, made a mistake because he thought uh, the music was the download. And now we all know, no, the music is mostly the streaming. So, so this kind of customer uh, self-service, automated customer self-service, it means that we sort of, um, uh, yeah, well, I read a book when I was uh, beginning at university in 1980s that says we cannot make a living from cutting our own hair. Um, uh, from cutting other people's hair. And we have learned how to do that with 
London being one of the world's largest hair salons with the management uh, hair uh, salons, um, management salons, uh, law salons, uh, all sorts of service work that really is just, we're just cutting each other's hair. But these digital platforms, it raises the question of how can we make a living from cutting our own hair because increasingly stuff can be done via those platforms. So um, I'll hand that over to, to Leslie later on. Um, and of course, what also has happened is that the, the speed of the internet as a way of finding the winners, because there's no real difference maybe between the best and the second best. And then people tend to somehow congregate in fewer of these. And some people have argued that this creates winner takes all markets. And while there's some discussion on whether this is true, that it is certainly the case that these platforms have increasing power that we need to understand, which will probably be the core of the next speaker. Thank you for your time. Wonderful, Carsten. Thank you for that introduction. And indeed, the point that you just raised, the winner-take-all market that has arisen in, in so many sectors is critical to the question of what power these companies have amassed. And that is the topic that I would like our second speaker to address. Let me introduce Neve Dunn, who is an associate professor in the law department here at the LSE. Neve is a specialist in the area of competition law and also European Union law. And she's also gained direct experience with com competition enforcement activities when she was working for the Competition Authority of Ireland and also as a consultant for the OECD. So, Neve, um, Carsten raised the question already of, of the, the growing power of platform businesses, digital companies, the tech giants, and they are clearly now among the world's largest and most profitable companies. Some uh, are now so big that they threaten existing uh, regulations around competition and antitrust. Can you tell us more about um, what the challenge is to existing competition policies that arises from this sector and whether there's anything we can do about this? Yeah, so that's um, a, a great question. I don't think it's one that's amenable to any sort of clear single answer. Um, part of the problem is just a question of playing catch up here. Uh, so we've had competition policy since the uh, late 19th century in uh, the US, uh, but the sorts of business models, the sorts of services, the sorts of anti-competitive behavior that we are seeing in modern digital mar markets would just be completely sort of incomprehensible to uh, previous generations of, of competition economists, um, competition lawyers. And so there is a question of having to try and sort of almost retrofit the rules we have to deal with these uh, new problems to, uh, to, to, to a certain extent. One of the, the beauties of competition, or what, why, it's, why it's often so popular uh, as a kind of, as a, as a form of ad hoc regulation is its capacity for progressive development. So competition law is, is designed in a way that it's supposed to be able to encompass, um, to, to, to adapt to new market problems. Um, but that still takes a bit of time. And so you're kind of, it has taken rather longer in the US. We're only now seeing in, in the last few months, the US authorities starting to bring some cases. Um, we've had a, a rather uh, longer history of enforcement against big tech in Europe. Um, the European Commission has at least the last five years been quite aggressively uh, taking cases against some of the big tech giants. But we still have questions of how well these established principles actually fit these, these new markets and new models. So to give you uh, a, an example, uh, probably the clearer uh, rule in competition law is a rule against hardcore price fixing between competitors, um, obviously prohibited, and you can go to prison. Uh, you, human individuals can go to prison if they engage in price fixing. What happens if that price fixing takes place through um, price setting algorithms? So there's no human involvement. It's just aut autonomous learning algorithms. Um, should that be prohibited? Should we hold the firms responsible? Should we be sending you know, business managers, um, algorithm developers to prison if, if, this, if, if this results? Um, another example more related to the dominance question would be, for example, the, uh, um, uh, the ongoing investigation that the European Commission um, uh, is taking into Amazon's um, marketplace. So uh, Amazon operates the marketplace where third party sellers can um, meet uh, customers and, and sell over the internet. Um, uh, what Amazon is, is accused of doing is taking advantage of, it, of its uh, market position in that marketplace um, uh, sector, uh, all of the information it gets um, from 
so facilitating those sales between third party retailers and um, customers um, and essentially going into business against its own uh, retailer customers by copying their inventions, by copying their best selling products and selling them at a lower price. Um, it is well recognized that you know, supermarkets do this all the time when they preference their own own brand products and we don't have a problem with it from a competition policy perspective. But is there something unique or is there something very specific about the market power of Amazon or perhaps it's information collecting um, advantages, the data advantages it has in the digital sphere that means that actually we should make this illegal. We should impose a duty of non-discrimination um, on Amazon as a result. So we have, I suppose, the, the, the law is sort of playing catch up, but it does have to adapt to very different market circumstances. Um, and the sorts of features that, that, that Karsten described, so the, the fact that we often have very strong economic power, but a lot of these markets are not clear monopolies. They are, for example, duopolies. So in advertising, you've got Google and Facebook. In, um, in OSs, you've got Google um, and uh, Apple. And so there's not, it's not always clear that if, if we kind of look at the kind of conventional understanding of what is a monopolist, that we actually have monopolies. And this is this problem of we no longer really have markets. We've got these ecosystems where all the, the, the boundaries get a bit blurred between products, between um, providers. Um, a second uh, reason I think that competition law is falling behind a little bit here is that competition law has over the past a few decades become a very technical discipline and it's really become quite a conservative discipline and there's a particular uh, a real fear of over enforcement and sort of chilling competition which is the phrase that is used um, and that's a really big issue particularly in the digital sphere because of course innovation is such a, a, a massive factor and so um, particularly in the US there has for the past couple of decades been this great reluctance to intervene in markets because the assumption is, well, these are fast moving markets. We don't want to deter these businesses from innovating in a way that's going to be pro-consumer. We don't know how the market's going to evolve. It's evolving so quickly. We can't second guess it. Best just leave it to the market and the market will eventually fix itself. I think that's no longer being seen as kind of an, an acceptable, accept, acceptable um, answer. But we still have this problem of how do we account for innovation? How do we facilitate innovation uh, with, while still controlling the market power um, of uh, the, the, the innovators. And um, in many jurisdictions, the answer seems to be we're going to actually have to change competition law. So in Europe, for instance, they're planning to bring in a new competition tool, as well as essentially a code of conduct for big, uh, what are called gatekeeper platforms, which have this sort of strategic market position. It's sort of inspired by competition law, but it's not quite competition law. It's adjacent to, because there's an acknowledgement that maybe we need to sort of change some of the theories, the approaches that we have. Um, a third problem, and this is maybe less a question of law and much more a question of policy, is just lobbying. There is so much lobbying all the time, everywhere in, you know, so many people make millions of, of, of euro of dollars in Brussels and Washington uh, lobbying for and against tech regulation. Um, this is something which extends today, I am afraid to say, to uh, the disciplines of competition law and competition economics. So much research today is funded by the big tech companies or by what the, you put in the footnote parties adverse to Google or parties adverse to um, Amazon and it's something that's always happened in economics it isn't something that's happened in in law so much so this isn't unique for us um, and uh, it means we've got these really polarized debates where either you're saying big tech is evil we need to break it up we need to destroy it everybody should go back to blackboards and abacuses or big tech is brilliant leave it alone you don't understand it's all about chump drawer and dynamic competition and there's not very much sort of nuanced um, in the middle uh, and I should say um, I'm a little bit skeptical of, of any funding even the funding that seems to be pushing for um, the kind of greater regulation because one of the most prominent uh, sort of a, a very brilliant uh, sort of individual who is, is pushing for greater uh, sort of tech regulation. You know, let's take down Google, let's take down Facebook in Europe um, is, a, is an economist um, who's one of their major clients that works with, for their, uh, that, that they work for in their consultancy is News Corp. So it's, um, it's Rupert Murdoch. And so you have, you know, who's on the side of the angels? Is it Google? Is, is it Fox News? I don't know, there doesn't seem to be any good answers there really. Uh, and so it all gets a bit murky. Um, final point, and I think this actually it, it picks up on some of the things that, that Karsten has mentioned, but also I think very much um, will go to what uh, uh, Leslie will talk about, um, is the fact that a lot of the problems that are being, I suppose, put on the doorstep of competition law um, 
don't always look like they're really competition problems. Um, the thing about competition laws, it's there in the background all the time. It's the residual regulator. If everything else fails, if you can't persuade Congress or the European Parliament to bring in some direct regulation, well, you've always got antitrust and you can kind of go and use it to kind of tweak the market. Um, a lot of the issues that are being discussed are things like, you know, uh, Facebook uh, not complying with data privacy um, requirements or Amazon or Uber exploiting their vulnerable workers. Uh, and we should use competition law because these are big problems and these are dominant firms. We should use competition law to fix the problem. There is a little bit of a difficulty there. There's a, there's a disjoint between the, the problem and I suppose the solution competition law gives you. Competition law is great at creating an open, competitive, contestable market. It's not necessarily so good at forcing Facebook to comply with the GDPR or Amazon to give sick pay or maternity pay uh, to its, its warehouse workers or whatever um, it might be. And so there is this question of how far we should be pushing competition law. And you know, if it's the only regulatory tool available to us, is that a good justification for using it to achieve something that looks, but it's like, it's not really a kind of a competition law issue at the end of the day. That's Wonderful, Neve. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you have really packed a lot into that, and, and that gives us a good sense of both the, the challenges and the limitations of, of competition law. Now, um, the question of future employment has already come up in, in the first two statements. And I want to now turn to our third speaker, Leslie Wilcox, who's an emeritus professor of work, technology and globalization in the Department of Management here at LSE. In his research, Leslie has long focused on how automation, robotics and artificial intelligence are transforming the workplace and he's thought deeply about the impact that technology will have on future patterns of employment. Leslie, let me bring you into this conversation. One of the big concerns about technology and innovation, especially AI and robotics, is of course the impact that they're having on future employment. Some analysts are predicting a continuous loss of jobs that we're facing, perhaps a future of profound technological unemployment. How do you see this? Are you on the side of pessimists, perhaps, or do you have a I'm more on the side statement? of evidence so far as we've got evidence? And I would like to correct many of the misrepresentations about and the hype and fear that surrounds the subjects of automation and the future of work. Because a, a way of seeing is also a way of not seeing, to quote Castaneda. And that conditions how we're going to deal with technological disruption in the future. Uh, one of the big figures, for example, that is put out about job loss uh, over the next 10 to 20 years is 47% globally, which came was born in 2014 in a Frey and Osborne study, which is much quoted. Uh, it's got very big methodological weaknesses, but also it's been superseded by a lot of evidence subsequently and prognostication. So I'd like to give you eight qualifiers to that figure and talk through quite a lot of the uh, issues about technology along the way and how organizations are adopting it. I mean, so the first qualifier I would say is that it's not about whole jobs being lost. It's only about 9% of whole jobs that can be automatable at this moment in time. And there is a question mark about whether they will be automatable, uh, automated. It's going to be about tasks and activities within jobs. 60% of jobs will be probably 30% or more automated in the next 10 years to 2030. That's a different picture from the one we're seeing. A lot of the studies, especially the early ones, left out job creation from technological deployment. Uh, the, the newer studies, and uh, we've looked at 700 organizations, by the way, in our own research, and we're finding that actually the net job loss from uh, technological deployment is about 1% net job loss. And that's supported by McKinsey's, PricewaterhouseCoopers, World Economic Forum, prognosticating forward um, for 18% of job loss on the global workforce, there's about 70%, 17 of job gain as a result of these technologies. The third factor is um, there's a great overbelief in this technology that it, it's a seamless tsunami of technologies entering our organizations that are uh, have welcoming arms. It's not like that. When you go around organizations, what you see is that technology never has been a fire and forget missile. 
and you know the looking at the history of technology it takes about 10 to 26 years for a major technology to be 90 percent utilized across the developed economies uh, and you have to it's like if you look at driverless vehicles which we were supposed to have by now um you know look forward it, the 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 adoption of them looks more and more marginalized as you go forward and get more real about it. That's just one example. The fourth factor is the huge belief in the perfectibility of the technology. It's either born perfect or is perfectible. Now, people who have worked with technology as I have since 1980 have always been told that it's going to be perfect one day. Uh, and 19,000 upgrades later, we're still working with uh, imperfect uh, perfect technology. So you can't believe uh, the advertising there. Um, the fifth factor is people grossly underrate the distinctive human skills that cannot be replicated by these technologies. We did a study of this and came out with 17 sets of skills people use at work. And we reckon that only six of those can be automated in any time next 10 years, completely automated, which leaves the majority of skills still owned by humans. So humans have strengths, especially skills in combinations that machines are unlikely to replicate um, anytime soon and sometimes long time into the future. You then get into the demographics, you know, the aging populations, China and Japan already have skills deficits, and that's why they're automating like mad. It's a, it's a coping mechanism as much as, uh, um, and it's also a, a mechanism to drive growth because they're not gonna meet their growth targets, any of these developed economies, unless they start using these automations for technologies very seriously. Um, and also there's a skill shortage uh, in a lot of places in developed economies and automation again becomes a, a coping mechanism for, for those. Um, I think another factor, I, I think the only original thing I have to say, although I'm, it's quite a good synthesis, I think, of where the work is, but the original thing is people are, are always assume that the amount of work to be done re, re, remains stable. In fact, the amount of work to be done increases dramatically year on year. And I I write somewhere uh, of what, what those factors are that make that the case. But let's assume that conservatively, work increases 10 to 15% per annum. Then this immediately throws out the whole equation about automation equals job loss. Um, so what we're going to see is not net job loss. That's not going to be the serious issue. It's going to be dramatic skill shifts. And if I'm running out of time, and tell me if I am, Rob, Robert, I can talk about this in the question and answers, but low skilled work will go from, say, 44% of the workforce globally to about 32%. There will be skill shifts towards the areas which are quite well known now, non-repetitive work, digital work, uh, STEM skills, cognitive skills, distinctive human skills that cannot be replicated, and medium to high skills. And I don't think any of us, corporates, governments, or individuals are that well set up to actually deal with that dramatic skill shift. That's where we are, I think. Wonderful, thank you. That is very encouraging indeed. Um, good, um, thank you panelists for sticking to the time. That means we have just under half an hour left for the Q&A session and I, I've already seen lots and lots of questions coming in. I'm going to not put my personal questions that I had prepared to the panelists because I want to engage as many people in the audience as possible. But before I do that, uh, let me just note that, um, that uh, there is a current student protest going on at the LSE over uh, student rents, uh, rents for student accommodation. And there are lots and lots of questions that have been put to us uh, in the Q&A in the chat room. I just want to acknowledge that this is going on. And had it not been for COVID, we would be probably sitting now in a LSE lecture theater and the students would make themselves heard in a very noisy way as they do at the LSE. So I just want to acknowledge that that is going on and there are a lot of people in the audience who are concerned about that. 
Um, uh, a colleague of mine has already pointed out that there will be a forum to discuss these matters that will be taking place, so you will find that in the chat. However, this event is not designed to address the topic, so I'm going to move on and take the questions that will be uh, relevant to the topic of our discussion. So, there's lots and lots coming in, and if you have other questions, please put them in the Q&A function. Let me start with a question that um, Bill Smythe Smith has put, uh, and others have also uh, commented on that. And Bill refers to a recent editorial in The Economist magazine, in which The Economist argues that if we look at the global technology sector, competition has actually increased. And the implied argument is that we shouldn't worry about technology companies and their power in the market, because as companies mature, uh, there will be more increased competition. Um, let me start with Carsten and Neve on this. How do you assess the global trend in technology markets overall in terms of market concentration and power? Carsten, do you want to kick off and then I'll turn to Neve? Yeah. So, so, so I think the, 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 the key thing we need to acknowledge here is that by looking at these platforms floating freely on the internet is uh, not, in my view, the proper way to look at it. The way we need to look at it is we need to look at them uh, situated in between two elements. So on the, uh, you have somebody provide a service of some sort that then can be serviced on that platform. So there can be an app developer, it can be somebody who wants to sell on Amazon. But what's really important, I think, from my point of view, is not the only important thing, but I think this is the key thing to understand in terms of competition, is that uh, all platforms, they need an infrastructure to deliver the service. So they capture the value. So they can take a 30% tax. But in order to distribute the service, they need an infrastructure. And the reason we don't talk about that is because Apple and Google, they have just used the fact that we all pay for the internet on our mobile phones or our cable modems. So we have all paid uh, collectively through public funding and through my, our own purse for, for Google and Apple to be able to have this lovely infrastructure that they can deliver their uh, their uh, services on. Now, Amazon, they have spent enormous amount of money building out their own logistics system, warehouses, delivery drivers, all of this stuff. And that's why uh, Amazon's cloud uh, part has 60% profit, whereas Amazon's delivery part has uh, a loss most years. So I think the key thing to look at here is that increasingly these platforms, they don't want to be platforms, they want to be infrastructures. And if you look at the recent battle between Apple and Facebook about the ID on your phone, whether you should be able to stop Facebook snooping uh, all you do across apps on your phone, uh, this shows exactly that this is Apple's challenge to Facebook to say you should not be a privacy hugging infrastructure. So the, the whole key here is the more they become infrastructure, the more they, in my view, utilities, although I'm not a lawyer, so I'm sure Neve can correct me, but I see them then as utilities. And I think the difference between Amazon and Sainsbury is that Sainsbury is not a utility. It is a shop amongst others. It doesn't have that percentage of the market power. So I think for me, always look where it's silence, as a famous author once said, the power is in these platforms becoming infrastructural. And once they are, the game game is over. Great. Neve, how do you see that? Uh, Neve, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, you think a year in, I would, I would have, I'd be used to this now. So apologies. I, I, I agree very much with what, what's just been said. I think also it's interesting. The Economist has been pushing for years and years for more competition enforcement, and now they're getting competition enforcement and perhaps getting cold feet. Um, I will say, I suppose, just a, just a few thoughts. Um, there is a big difference between economic power and obviously, you know, billion-dollar companies like uh, Facebook and Amazon and Google. Um, are have huge amounts of economic power and market power as such. And so market power is essentially a monopoly controlling a market segment. And this is back to this kind of point I mentioned earlier about these markets becoming more like ecosystems and, and the boundaries blurring a little bit. And so um, actually, yeah, there might be quite a lot of competition, but it is competition between hugely powerful entities. And so it's, it's more difficult to kind of conceptualize that. We, we might still have a problem with it, whether we have a problem with it from a, whether it's like a true antitrust um, uh, issue. Uh, I think very much the, the point about these entities becoming more like utilities uh, is, is, a, is a really good one. Um, of course, how we deal with utilities typically isn't 
through competition enforcement, we don't say you're breaching your monopoly. We have ex ante regulation. We have utilities regulation, you know, common carrier regulation, price regulation. Um, and some of the legislative proposals, particularly in Europe at the moment, look really like that. Um, these ex ante duties are going to be enforced by the European Commission. Um, a whole list of prohibited uh, practices if you are a gatekeeper, if you have the sort of significant market status. Um, the other point I guess I would make is that uh, competition law doesn't really have a problem with, with absence of competition as such, where it has a problem is with bad behavior. And so the, another question we have to ask is whether you know, a lot of people have a problem with Google because it's huge, because it has such power and you think it's a threat to democracy and so forth. But that's not really, I mean, if, if that's not really a, a public policy issue. If it's delivering products that consumers want and need and it's giving to them for free or at least no monetary price, should we be a bit reluctant to intervene simply for the sake of you know, making a market competitive for competition's sake isn't maybe that valuable? Mm, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. I, I want to stick to this topic just for a moment because there are a couple of other questions that people have put to us. Um, uh, uh, VJ is asking, should these tech giants be broken up as a consequence of the, the power they've amassed? And uh, Girija, I hope I've pronounced the name correctly, Girija uh, Ramapriya is asking, is Big Tech not too big to fail at this point? Have they reached that sort of size and status in the economy that they're too difficult to deal with through normal regulatory processes? But I think the two questions go together. And it's, it's about this idea that perhaps if there are indeed uh, too big for competition and markets to function, they need to be broken up. Do you believe in that, Neve, as a solution? Um, I guess it's an empirical question, right? And that's, and that's the difficulty. I think that uh, that question gets asked a lot from a very ideological, ideological perspective today. Um, it's it's a, just, again, this aversion to having these very large, very powerful entities. And a lot of, quite a few of these very powerful entities have problems associated with them that could certainly deal with, you know, have better regulation. So Uber exploiting its drivers or Facebook uh, not respecting data protection norms or not dealing with hate speech or not dealing with fake news or whatever it, um, it may be. And these, these are certainly really big problems, I think. Uh, I don't know that they necessarily mandate or would be solved by breaking these entities up. Uh, and so you need to have a, a, a plausible reason why it would be a, a good thing to do this. There is also um, one of my one of my, my, my real heroes um, in a competition law, a guy called Herbert Hovenkamp, uh, is has always been a very progressive scholar in competition law, but he really pushes back against this new Brandeisian and let's break everything up movement because he says, look, if you break up these companies, you're going to make them inefficient. If you force them to charge for products they previously provided for free, well, then you're going to hit the most vulnerable most immediately and most acutely because the people who have the least are going to suffer the most from having to you know, pay more or get, getting a, um, a less good deal. Um, and so I, I think there is a, a real, I, I don't think it should be ideology that's deciding this. I think it should be science, but whether science can actually give us a, a, a clear answer is more difficult. Mm, yes, indeed. Thank you. Let me turn to... Um... Leslie, just, and, and there are some, oh, Carsten, you want yeah, to so Just back. a very shortly, I mean, again, to uh, take an argument that's been fought in the economy is that digital technologies are not like other kinds of technologies, and therefore these digital platforms are not like other kinds of physical arrangements. So you could say, uh, hypothetically, you broke up Google like you broke up AT&T into the mini bells uh, many years ago, and uh, whichever part of them got the deep mind offices just north of us, if we had been at LSE in King's Cross, uh, they might have such an edge because they will be able to be more effective in competing, uh, out competing the others. So the point is there, we have no idea what the consequences are, and we could end up in exactly the same situation uh, five years down the line as we are now. So I, I completely agree. I don't think breaking up necessarily solves anything because of the nature of the technology. Can mm. I add one thing, which is we're forgetting geographies. Different geographies will regulate this and respond to this in different ways. USA is going to be different from Europe in the way that they approach this problem and probably different again from the UK. And China is going to have a completely different view as to what to do about big tech giants, including their own. 
Indeed, indeed. Uh, talking of different geographies, there are a couple of questions that have asked specifically about the future of work that we are going to face. And, and let me turn to Leslie, therefore, with a couple of questions. Um, one question is about how these job losses that are coming down the way, even if we are able to create new jobs, how they will play out differently in different locations. Should we not think of localized uh, job markets more than we do currently, because even if the net balance is, uh, this is a question from Ed Lyons, who's an economic advisor in the civil service, who says, even if the net balance is, is positive, we may find that in certain locations, people are losing jobs. That's correct. Absolutely correct. That there's going to be massive variation between country, sector, even city. And um, I can't give you chapter and verse for each of those uh, at the moment. But uh, it is very, going to be a very variable picture. Um, and uh, some countries, for example, are, are going to have very cheap labor into the future and might not well not automate tasks that are automatable, for example, just one factor. Um, and uh, there are certain job areas which are definitely automatable, where there are going to be big job losses. And there are certain other ones that uh, that's not going to be the case. Um, so, uh, yes, we have to manage the variation in technological disruption. It's not going to be the same everywhere at all. There's a question from Paula Mirazzo. She's asking about that very point you've just raised about how the future of work will look like in developing countries as compared to developed economies. Uh, she's asking, what are your thoughts on the impact of big tech on uh, those jobs in developing countries? She's speaking of Latin America. Should we expect a greater job displacement there than anywhere else? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question because to some extent, you've got the opportunity to leap, leap several stages in developing economies because a lot of the developed economies have this massive technological legacy, they even call it te technology debt these days, uh, dragging them back from actually implementing these new technologies. So there's that factor at play, but it needs a lot of imagination, organization, and the, the available skill in developing economies to start adopting advanced technologies. And some of them are just not easy to adopt. Um, there's massive hype about artificial intelligence and what it can do, mainly because there's a massive amount of money going into it, but not very much is coming out the other end. Um, you know, I, I'm fond of my, saying my joke here about how when it comes to hyperbole and about AI, it's not just the pigs that are flying, it's the whole farm. Um, it, it is just stupendously overhyped. Um, and so uh, develop developed economies have the same problems as developing economies there. Um, but then there's the issue of, uh, you know, how are they going to be impacted about by uh, developed economies use of these technologies um, and usually uh, probably adversely and how can they organically grow their own uh, distinctive use of these technologies to fit their own problems as, as they arise. But again, there's also this issue of what being economies. People still call uh, China an emerging economy. It happens to be the second, probably the first biggest economy in the world. And, and it's heavily into automation, you know, hoping to be the world leader by 2030. So you've got to be very careful about these definitions. And, and you know, sometimes in the United Kingdom, we think that we might be a developed economy, but there are sort of disadvantages in being a developed economy with all that infrastructure that's aging and uh, we have to maintain and all that legacy that we uh, can't get rid of in order to get into the new new technologies. Mm, indeed, and, and we do carry mental frameworks with us that, that needs uh, urgent uh, change and adaptation. Mm. Um, there's a question from Martin Yoder, which is really for the whole panel. And it also links into the question about jobs and future tasks. And the question is, now that we're undergoing a massive shift to working from home, what do the panelists think will be the effects 
in the respective areas that you research? What do you expect as the biggest impact in your area that you research? And let me also bring in a question from Elena, who is asking, uh, what skills will matter in the future more, uh, particularly when existing tasks and jobs have been automated? What are the sort of the, the future areas of work that we should expect? Who would, Carsten, let me stop with Carsten. And, and Leslie, I'll, I'll, as the expert in, in the area of work, I'll come back to you at the end. Carsten first. Well, so it's absolutely clear that uh, we, we are still in the hurricane. So it's extremely difficult to see, but as it, it, to use the to use the comparison of the of, of nationalized healthcare in the U.S., where when suddenly people have a compre comprehensive healthcare uh, provision, then they see that there is a, a, this is an opportunity, it's an option. And I think what people now have seen across all white collar workers uh, in, in in most of the world, they've seen that you don't have to be on the central line in London, scrap pushed together with everybody else. And but the, the point is there, you can also then see. So maybe the genie is out of the bottle. That's the one argument. So we will now never have a meeting in person again. On the other hand, all research from I've done on collaboration the last 40 years shows that people are herd animals. We need to be together in order to get social cohesion. But you could hope that companies, for example, organizations would start uh, addressing this by designing it more cleverly. So maybe we should have the meetings in, on Zoom or Teams, but then we should have some events where we just have fun together and play games and get to know each other. Because the whole point is what we also have seen through COVID is you can see I have a drum kit in the back. I could give you a drum solo. Uh, and so this whole idea, we get to know each other's private lives and the dog comes rushing in. The daughter says there's no hot water. So we, we have this very practical mingling of, of, of private and working life. And I think maybe we should look more into that. I, I definitely do not think we're just all going to accept going back to having all the dreadful meetings at LSE again. I hope not, Robert. Please. Carsten, I'm sure there were some good ones too. <laughs> Eve. Um, so I have to say that the, the things I can think of are quite tangential because uh, competition law and policy tends to be aggregated at a much higher level than I suppose individuals in, in, in uh, offices are working from home. There has been some interesting um, movements with respect to uh, making clear, particularly in, in EU law, that say self-employed uh, Uber drivers or self-employed uh, uh, delivery, um, uh, Amazon delivery uh, people um, are not subject to competition. This actually has been a problem. Technically, if you're self-employed, you're an independent business. And so if you, for example, join a trade union, um, that's seen as an illegal cartel, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but I think the prominence of you know, the, the role that has been played by uh, delivery people, self-employed delivery people um, during the pandemic is something which has made this more of a, an interesting uh, political issue. I guess the only, um, if, if we're thinking of uh, pandemic consequences for competition on policy, a, a lot of it has been the question of subsidies, which is just very different, but the extent to which uh, governments can and should be intervening in, in the economy to prop up businesses and when that might become problematic, but it is it's quite far from the question that was asked. I apologize. <laughs> that's great. No, no, that's good. Thanks, Neve. Um, Leslie, so what are the skills that you were talking about earlier that will remain well, that we will still be needing can to, I, can to I develop? Come, come to that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say that the virus experience has, has had enormous impacts, but the interesting question is how permanent they're going to be and how scarring have they been? I, I sort of make four points, I think. The first one is it has accelerated the uptake on technologies. But uh, in the research that we have done, uh, it's 65% of the organizations of, of, are entirely about short-term use of those technologies uh, to build resilience and to get work done. Uh, very few organizations have taken a long-term view as to how to employ those digital technologies. We reckon about 20%. Now, whether that changes in the future is another question. There's a lot of rhetoric around, yeah, we're now convinced that we're all going to go into digital transformation, but they're also desperately paddling to stay still um, in their own markets, a lot of these organizations. So you, I think you're going to see 15 to 20% of organizations escape, have escape velocity and it become real winners in their sectors and the rest are going to be uh, behind frantically trying to catch up. The second one is uh, this, the Carsten's point about remote working. Again, I'm not sure how long term 
this is going to be an irreversible in its impact. A lot of the studies that we, we're seeing suggest that senior managers say, well, I can see two to three days a week for certain jobs, but not forever uh, and uh, probably not for most people. You remember that you know, the US workforce, 65% of them can't really do remote work. Their job depends upon being physically located. So you've got that factor and in developing economies, it's even more than that. So there's that factor. The third point I'd make is that I think what we're moving to is an even more enhanced version, enhanced by the digital undertow of it, the under the in digital infrastructure is a, a core periphery model where increasingly the kind of work, uh, the core is going to be lesser and lesser people, but you're going to get functional and numerical flexibility a little there. And then you're going to go to the peripheral labor markets uh, and they're, they're going to be more and more disadvantaged the further you get out in that labor market until you have to bring people into the market who are ostensibly self-employed, but might well be, as we've seen, Uber workers or, or farm pickers or something like that. So uh, we, wait, we wait to see how that plays out, but I'm pretty sure there's going to be a core periphery model and there's going to be a, a central core, a secondary group and a third group uh, and um, increasingly disadvantaged terms and probably more surveyed than ever before. I think the fourth point I'd make, the last point is that I think the coronavirus year is going to have dual impacts. I think one positive impact is that it's been a very good learning experience about how we have to support labor markets, which might shift governments to be much more active about what they do with labor markets and skill shifts. But uh, it also, unfortunately, might have undermined our ability to do that. We are, where's the cash going to come from is something we were asking yesterday in the, the UK budget. So there is serious, there are serious skill shifts, but let me say, if we can't make those skill shifts, that might well delay the adoption of those technologies. Um, so there's, it's not a, a monocausal event here. The technologies are here. We need to debt the skills. Having the skills determines whether we can adopt the technologies or not. Mm, very interesting. Um, I have a last question to you all, and then I'm going to add a very last question at the end. I'm going to give you the very last question now, because Katarina <laughs> has asked the panelists, what recent innovation has impressed you most? I'm going to give you some time to think about that. Please nominate just the one innovation in recent years that has impressed you the most. But before we get to that, panelists, there are two interesting questions. One has been asked by Aki with reference to Australia's recent efforts to force Facebook to pay for the news that they distribute on their webpage. And there's another question from Samzarin, who's asking, with technology operating in a global context, do we not need to move all these regulations that you've been talking about to the global level and harmonize these standards? And, and the Australia yeah. case raises, we have very little time left. So if you could address very briefly, the global regulation question first, just one sentence, and then I'll come back to the last one. Leslie, quick answer. Well, my big issue is the, the fact that risk is now systemic, as has been said uh, by better people than me. Uh, and you can only deal with the, the problems uh, that we have been generating in a systemic interconnected way. So yes, I do believe that intercontinental regulation is the way we have to go, but we all recognize it's hugely challenging. We probably need several big crises to get people to start cooperating in that, at that level. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Neve, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, I, I think that, I think there is a growing global consensus that these issues need to be addressed. And so you are seeing uh, it is not, you know, Europe used to be the leader here, but you were seeing um, efforts in the US, as I mentioned, in the last couple of months. Um, Australia is a, is, a, is a big leader here. And Australia is an interesting example. I'm a little bit skeptical about the, the Facebook news thing, because I think a lot of that is, again, Murdoch. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's why, you know, uh, people want to be paid for their content. He must be paid for his content. But there is a, um, a really interesting example with the Google Fitbit uh, merger, which privacy experts thought was absolutely horrendous. Um, the European Commission 
uh, passed it. And Australia has said, actually, we're not convinced that the remedies that you are offering um, are satisfactory and we're still waiting to hear what they say. But it's a, you know, a, a relatively small country globally might actually make very large changes to this deal involving one of the largest com com uh, countries on Earth. So small countries can make a difference. And so the hope is that policies such as these will then be diffused around the world. We learn from good experiences, best practices, yeah. Yeah. Um, even if global harmonization may not be on the agenda. Carsten, do you have anything yeah. to add? Yeah, I just want to say when, when, when EU uh, elects Juncker to lead them and uh, tries desperately to have an internal digital market, and if there's still regulatory divergence, so companies, they go to Amsterdam, Dublin or Luxembourg, uh, I think we should dampen our hopes for global regulatory alignment on these issues, especially because as one of the comments in the chat said, like most of these platforms are uh, from the US, we only have Spotify and maybe a bit of SAP. So we, it's easy for us to tax Amazon, but uh, are the Americans going to allow that? So I, I wouldn't put my hopes too high on that. Indeed, indeed. Good. So now to the very last question. Uh, you, you have a chance to nominate your most impressive innovation in the recent uh, years. I'm going to go in the order in which the panel started. So, Carsten, can I start with you? Yes, I should really say Zoom, because this is the infrastructure that made, had made my life possible. But I would nominate another one, uh, which is otter.ai. So, Helvarian, who is Google's chief economist and academic, he said he had coined uh, Varian's law, which was what is for the rich now is for all of us in 10 years time or in some time ahead. And otter.ai allows me to transcribe all Zoom meetings on papers with students and annotate. So I have lecture notes all done and the transcriptions are actually surprisingly good. And it comes at $50 for a whole year and almost infinite transcription power. I have paid Linda up from North of England 5,000 pounds in a project to transcribe for me, so I made her unemployed. But at one pound a minute, I can't afford to have all my meetings transcribed. So that would be my nomination, otter.ai. Fascinating, I didn't know about that. I will have to look it up. Neve. Oh, I feel like such a Luddite, I can't think of anything. Um, I, yeah, I, I feel like at the, at the moment with so much technology, the technology is, is more oppressive than liberating, but let me, um, uh, so maybe can, can I give, it, give that non-answer if that's okay? <laughs> That's okay entirely. Leslie, do you have a favorite innovation of recent No, I don't. I'm still waiting. Um, I'm still waiting. But what impresses me when I see it, and it's not that often, is the imagination with which people use existing technology. This is one of the greatest underrated truths about humankind, that very often we have the technology already. We don't need to get Joe, we whiz about the new technology. We just lack the imagination to utilize it in powerful ways. Um, I once uh, was asked, uh, what did I do with my computer uh, by Buzz Aldrin, the second man to sit on the moon? And I was shamefacedly, uh, I had to say, uh, well, I do word processing PowerPoint and I just discovered that I can do email. This is back in 2001. And he, he said, you're not going any time soon to the moon then. <laughs> that is true, and we hope you won't. Thank you all panelists. Well, just to add my own uh, recent discovery, uh, I've actually fallen back on very traditional technology. Having lived and worked from home with my family for the last year, we have come to appreciate the dishwasher as probably the 20th century greatest uh, <laughs> innovation indeed. Let me hand back to Russell, but before I do so, panelists Neve, Carsten and Leslie, thank you so much in joining, for joining me in this conversation. Thank you, Robert. And, and let me also thank uh, yourself, Leslie, Neve and Carsten for your time today. We're, we're really very grateful. And that was a, a, a brilliant discussion. Um, thank you all to all of you as well for joining us today. We hope that you've also enjoyed it and found it insightful. And it's uh, giving you an insight into what LSE Extended Education can offer you. You can find out more about the new online certificate course, Technological Disruption, Managing the Impact on Business, Society and Politics, which the team you've heard from today have been involved in building um, through uh, clicking on the website, onlinecourses.lse.ac.uk. And you can also find out about our entire portfolio of online courses via that link. 
If you have enjoyed this session and want to watch it again, or if you want to pass it on to any of your friends, then it will be available on YouTube and on the LSE Festival Hub from later today, where you can also find our other sessions, Decision Making on Monday, Presence and Influence on Tuesday, and Leadership and Change from yesterday. Our next and final event in the series will take place tomorrow at the same time, where we will be looking at how to use data for decision making. You can register to join the event on the LSE Festival page now, and we very much hope to see you then. Thank you very much again for joining us today, and goodbye for now.